Hi, this is Gloria, your life coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ron Johnson, your life coach, health coach, and motivational speaker. And today we have a glimmer of sunshine, an awesome person, and we have a special guest, and her name is Ray Carmen. Ray, tell us about yourself as we get to know you. Awesome. I just want to say thank you, uh, Ronald and Gloria, for having me on your podcast today and to be able to sit with you guys in Mind Jam. And a little bit about who I am is I come from a corporate background. I spent 10 years uh, working in technology. I worked for Hewlett Packard and Cisco Systems. And it was during the 10 years that I started to have a lot of health problems. And I went from a tiny little frame of like 120 pounds to 215. I had type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. And I had gotten stuck in the rat race of life. I was on the hamster wheel and I was working, you know, 60 hour plus weeks. And what happened is, is I was working late one night And I came home, or I was coming home, and I got hit by a semi-diesel truck. And Mm -hmm. it just totaled my truck. I was really lucky. I was not physically hurt by the grace of God and the angels protecting me. And I was sent to the emergency room right away because I couldn't move my neck, which was probably understandable because you get whiplash. And I came out and I came home and the next day my doctor called me and she called really early. It was like 7 a.m. in the morning and I used to be a nurse prior to working in technology. I was a trauma ER nurse. And so I knew getting a call from your doctor that early in the morning was probably not going to look good. And she called and she's like, how was your neck? And I was like, well, it's stiff. I can't move it. And she's like, do you feel anything? And I was like, feel anything? Well, I'm numb. I mean, it's uncomfortable. And she's like, please come into the office right away. And so, you know, my heart skipped a beat. And I was like, oh, this this isn't looking good for me. And I get to the doctor's office. And normally they stop. And they, they get your blood pressure. They check your weight. And they do all of the stats. And they took me straight to the room. Skipped all of that. And they just had me sit there. And I just remember that day they had a TV screen and it was playing the news and I'm sitting at the table and I'm just like, what is going on? I felt like I was in a dream and I started to like have a little bit of palpitations and anxiety. And she came in and she started to pry her fingers in my throat. And I was like, what's going on? And she's like, do you feel that? And I'm like, feel what? And she's like, you, she's like, you have a tumor in your throat. And I'm like, oh, what? And I was like, I don't even smoke. And she's like, I know. And she's like, and for the last year, you've been complaining of sore throats. And it looks like you have a tumor. And she pulled up the x-rays. And she's like, it's half the size of a golf ball. And I was like, holy crap. And I just remember like my whole world stopped. And it just paused. And I just remembered in the last three years, I lost three amazing women in my life. The first one was my aunt. She died of a heart attack in 7-Eleven. And then she was only 50 years old. And then my grandmother died at a very young age. She was about 72 and she died of cancer. And then my aunt, my other aunt, uh, she also died at 50 of breast cancer. And it was just in that moment that like reality hit. And it was like, girl, you got to get your shit together. I'm sorry. I'm cussing. I hope that's okay. Yes, Um, please. Okay. (laughs) That's fine. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) And I was like, oh my God, like what is going on? And immediately they threw me into oncology. And within 24 hours, we found out that I was a stage three throat tumor. And the doctor told me, she's like, if it wasn't for the car accident, she's like, you probably would have been at stage four at any day now. And I was like, wow, like that car accident was the biggest blessing in my life. It was a huge impact. And that came in that really shook up my world. And that's when I went on a self-discovery journey. And really what it was, was getting my health back and getting back into my body. 
and I started to diet. I hired my first health coach. I hired a nutritionist and I started to have amazing results. And through that space, I was introduced to fitness uh, competitions with the NPC, IFBB Pro, WBFF. And I was doing so amazing with these results. And I was feeling confident about myself. I was like, sure, let's do a fitness competition. And I didn't realize that that was going to be the next phase of my evolution. And what happened is, is my body looked amazing. I was working really hard again about, and you know this, uh, Ron, working, you know, four hours in the gym and just running myself thin and just doing everything I could uh, to look good. But in the background, I was dealing with negative uh, conversations with myself, uh, negative limiting beliefs of I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, uh, I'm not going to win. There was like a lot of negative forces that I was dealing with internally. I ended up having an eating disorder, body dysmorphia, and an, you know something that's so beautiful as to taking back your health was actually now cripple, crippling me. And I ended up going down a path of using steroids um, in order to continue placing in these shows. And I didn't have the awareness of what steroids would do for me later on in life. They were making me look great in the moment, but later on, I hit a lot of repercussions with my thyroid, adrenal gland, uh, fatigue, and having a lot of gut issues. And through that space, you know, I was dealing with stress, anxiety, comparison, uh, dealing with imposter syndrome, things like that. I took on a, a negative habit, uh, something that wasn't serving me. And I ended up going down a path of utilizing cocaine um, on a regular basis and being in a space of um, using Molly. And so I was all my hard work that I was doing for my body. I was just causing self-sabotage um, in these other spaces. And through that is when I started working with a business coach. Uh, I had my own gym at the time. I was a personal trainer. Um, I was a health coach, but here I was with imposter syndrome. Um, and I worked with a business coach who said, I think that you need to learn more about mindset training when working with your clients. Because one of my complaints was people lose the weight, but they gain it right back. Or they do all this hard work, but then six months down the road, they're right back where they started. And he's like, oh, you, you probably need to learn NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And so because of that recommendation, I then started to learn all about mindset and neuroscience and limiting beliefs and biology of belief and energy. And so then that took me into the next space of my evolution. And I, in that space is where I believe I started to understand that if you understand your mindset and you let go of people pleasing and you let go of the fear of rejection and you learn that you need to choose yourself first and let go of people pleasing um, and caring what others think of you. I believe when you start to master your mindset, it opens up the portal of your purpose. And so from that space, I started to see that this was a space I loved. I love personal growth and development. I love to empower people. I like to see people have their biggest breakthroughs, whether it's inner child work, mother wounds, father wounds, traumas and tribulations, like letting go of the past. And from there, that part of my career, which I've been in since 2017, um, has now led me into a new space, or I shouldn't say a new space, but moved me now more into my spiritual evolution. Um, and now working with clients more in a shamanic space and taking them through beautiful processes of traveling um, within themselves and being inside their bodies um, and being able to heal themselves spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. And so it's been quite, quite the journey of where I've been and now really working with people in the space of 
there's more for me beyond the tangibles of the physical world, but there is this connection to God, source, universe, Jesus, whoever it is for you, and and being able to cultivate that relationship uh, through shamanic journeys, through breath work, somatic dance, um, embodiment, and uh, being with sound healing and tools um, in that aspect, and so that they can um, really be one with self and then be one with God. Amen to that story. (laughs) What a journey you've gone through. And, you know, you went through a few transitions there. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all different. Um, I don't even know where to start right now. That's you know, when it. I was listening to your story, it's, um, I'm looking out in front of my office right now. I moved to Bellingham, Washington. It's very green, very beautiful. And it's like, I'm going into, um, deja vu or I'm going to say it is deja vu because what you're saying is similar to my story. I'll just give you a light speed story. So I had the corporate job for like 14 years. And for me, I grew up fat and overweight and I had really low self-esteem, confidence issues and didn't know who I really was. And going through life, no one really tells you what is confident. They say, be confident. No one tells you what self-esteem is. They say, be self-esteem. They say, be this, be this. And you don't understand because you can't put the pieces together. Mm -hmm. So when I started my journey when I was 25 into competing, the purpose of really competing was to get the body I've always dreamed about because I had gynomastica, which is breast hits when I was a kid because of hormone issues. And I got made fun of a lot. So if I got the body, I'll get the girl, I get the car, I'll be happy, right? Mm-hmm. All these outer things. And it, it's just when, you, when I heard that story and myself, I became a victim of um, steroid abuse. I'm going to say abuse, but we don't know what you're doing. You didn't see a doctor. It mm-hmm. is abuse because all you, I call it the bro, bro prescription. It's some dude and knows a dude to get you the stuff. It tells you to take it like this, but he's not a doctor or physician. Mm-hmm. So let's call bro, bro science. So I got into taking um, T3, uh, T4, steroids from all different kinds of levels for years. Uh, I even one time in, injected my own um, glutes and I missed a spot and it actually went numb. I thought I had lost feeling because you just to internet and bro science. And just year after the year, I even hired a coach one time. He tells me that uh, I never forget this, um, that I don't have good genetics as for a black guy because a black guy's supposed to be ripped with a six pack and all this stuff. And I was just so overcome with trying to find myself, um, you know, I would do whatever it took to win. And obviously I didn't, I didn't get a trophy. I never made it to the IFBB pro. I never made it to the WNBF or whatever it may have been. Um, and what hit the nail on my coffin was two years, almost uh, a year ago, I had a client, first client ever had trained. And he wanted to first kind of train that wanted to compete and actually did through. Most people say they want to compete, but they don't go through the diet and all this kind of stuff. So he actually competed. I never forget we're at a restaurant and uh, he starts to cry and he says, you have changed my life. I can't believe how dedicated you were. Hmm. Right then, it told me right then and in there that Ron, you're not meant to win a competition. That's not your destiny. Mm-hmm. A month later, um, I signed up an iPad to become a life coach. Because I knew right then and there that was not my journey anymore. And the same thing I noticed when I trained clients, I used to get myself so much self-doubt and so much uh, uh, um, criticism, self-criticism, because, hey, I wrote this client a diet plan, a nutrition program. I'm training them. Why not losing the weight? Or they lose the weight in two weeks and they can't sustain it. What's really going on? And that's where I really realized, too, I need to get out of training because – it's not the training. See, the idea is if I lose 20 pounds, I feel better. But then, okay, what next? Okay, I get a new car. Okay, then what next? I get a new job. Okay, then what next? It's constant pothole filler. And that's why I started going into the mindset because you constantly are using these outer things to fill yourself. And when I heard your story, it sounds like my story just in a different way is I'm waking up to something I want. And as I'm going through this life and, you know, the drugs I've taken, the things I've experienced, I never got into drugs or cocaine or anything. I got marijuana, but that, that's, you know, that's not something I would say is a hard drug for me, but I don't, I don't use it or abuse it in any case. But now I realize that my life is more purpose, more meaningful hearing your story. And hearing your story gives me the fact that I'm on the right journey. I'm on the right path and I'm not over. It's not done for me yet. It's just beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, 
I have a question um, about this. We we all go through, we all have different journeys that we've gone through in our life and, you know, we're walking this path and our purpose. Um, you know, I've, I've also gone through or came from corporate and I went from corporate to now working with the kids at school and, and as a life coach. Why does it take for something to happen to us or to others to go through transitioning or finding or trying to figure out who we really are and finding ourselves? I love that question. And I, I want to respond um, with what I believe. And, and what I speak as my truth doesn't mean it has to be anyone else's truth. But right. what, what I've been taught and what really resonates in my body is that and I've been trained under Dr. Sue Mortar, and she is a doctor in energy medicine. And the belief is, is that we are all sitting at a bus stop. And it's before birth. It's before coming down um, into planet Earth. And we're sitting at a bus stop, and you have all these people there. And you're like, yeah, I'm so excited. We're going to get on the bus. We're going to go to planet Earth. And this time, this round, I really want to feel anger. Or this time, I really want to feel what it's like to have abandonment issues. Or in this, you know, this lifetime, I really want to learn, like, to not take things personally. And then at the bus stop, you enroll all the people. You're like, do you want to do this with me? Do you want to have these encounters? And, and you enroll them in it. And then what happens is, is you come down into planet Earth and you're born whole and complete. And you've asked to have these impacts, these trials and tribulations. And what I believe is, is that as we're going through the impacts, they are to actually wake us up. And we've had impact after impact and after impact, and they might have seemed small and very mesquite, I think is the word I want to use. But what happens is, is it's compound interest. And so it's like one event was to shake you up and to get you to wake up to your higher self, God, source, universe, Jesus, whatever it is. But it didn't do, it wasn't enough. So then the next impact comes in and then the next impact comes in. And what it is, is that what I believe is, is that you are the author, the director, and the writer of your life. It's already been designed for you. And you have these impacts come in to wake you up because most people, they don't go to that higher self. And I'm just going to use the word God until mm -hmm. something bad is happening in their life. And that's when we get on our knees and we pray or we go to church. It's typically when things are going wrong in our life. And so, um, you know, it's through, through those trials and tribulations that I feel is actually here to serve you, you know, like, so through every mess is a message or through every mess is a blessing. Um, and it's, and it's through those things, um, that wake us up to our next evolution where we're supposed to go. So it's almost like, you, you, you're on one path and then an impact comes in. So now you turn left and then an impact comes in. Now it's making you turn right. So it's actually there to be able to get you towards where you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And you, and you actually, and you do feel that. And I, I'm, I always say this, I was, I say this a lot in the podcast is feeling it in the heart. It's just, it's a different feeling when you get there and you know that this is it for you and this is the one that you've been looking for or maybe searching for because you really feel it in your heart. I mean, you know, in my case, I've gone through like you guys corporate and then I went through working for, you know, being a recruiter or sales or, you know, now working with kids. But I think it's always been we think we're happy where we are and we're doing the right thing, but there's still something missing. And then you move on to the next. It's always, it's almost like you're always in search for something. And then when you hit that, like you said, after those impacts, when you hit that spot, then that's when you really feel it. And I, like for me, in my case, I, you know, being a life coach and just going through these transitions and changes, I felt it more in my heart and I felt it in my gut. I just felt it. It was, it was just a different feeling and it was more, it became more of a passion for me rather than I'm just doing it. You know, when I hear you, you're, you're stating about being impact after impact, um, 
it reminds you of the the movie The Matrix. Uh-huh. You can take the blue pill or the red pill. You know, one of these pills you have, you will take, but which one do you want? Mm-hmm. And it, it's really ironic, you know, when we turn to God, and I've read this before in one of my conscious books, you only turn to God when, oh my God, this is happening to me. I, you know, what is going through my life? It's only, and it's then, then it's when we think that God should give us a perfectly wrapped present and help us. But a lot of things I know in life now, the things I experienced from final bankruptcy to having bad credit, to having kids at a young age and all this stuff, it has been there to help me. Mm-hmm. If I didn't go through that final bankruptcy, I didn't have kids at a young age, if I did not do all this stuff, who could I help out? Or more or less, where would I be at? I'll still be asleep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm a... And, go ahead. No, go ahead. And that is really the, the ironic thing is that people stay asleep forever. And it, 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 I had conversations with my mom about this. I shot a video about this on my video vlogs. But, you know, when I look at my mother, I love my mother. And she's one example I want to talk about. She's, we're talking on the phone. We're talking almost every other day. And on the phone the other day, she's like, you know, son, I, one day when I was growing up in Chicago, she grew really, really poor. I mean, dirt poor. They couldn't even find like five cents for a loaf of bread in the 70s, right? I mean, sorry, 50s. So one day she said, son, you know what? My mom had no money and my dad was in prison. And she told me a story that I'd never heard before. She went to an alley and she found 20 pennies. And that 20 pennies allowed them in those days to buy a loaf of bread, some crackers, and some meat, right? Because things are so less expensive in those days. But you saw, I saw tenacity. My mom told me that story. But then when I, I look at her life now, it's like, mom, what happened? Like, what's what's going on? So the question mean for you, Ray, is that based upon your experience, do some of us ever wake up or would you stay asleep? Yeah. Um, right now, I, I believe, we, so we've gone through three waves of awakening. So The first wave came after 2012 because the Mayan calendar ended. And so we had the first wave of awakening come through. And that's probably the wave of when you look at your eight-figure, nine-figure influencers. So they were the first wave. And then we came into a second wave, which was about 2016. And then now we're going through our third wave. And it's all because of the blessing of COVID. And so COVID came in and it made everyone stop. It made everyone go inside. And I mean, physically into their homes and then, and then also go inward with themselves. And I think more people that weren't already open to personal growth and development, they got to have an opportunity to slow down and be like, my friend has been recommending this podcast. My friends have been telling me about this YouTube channel. My friends have told me about these books. And the blessing of COVID is, is that it shook up everyone's containers. We became comfortable. And so now everyone's like, whoa, I need to go back to basics. People started to realize that I've been married for 20 years and I don't know my spouse. And people came to realize that now we're working from home. I've realized I don't even like my job. And so we're, we're in the third phase right now. Um, and we're probably not going to have another wave for a couple of more years. Um, and that's where I feel like the blessing of COVID has come. And there are people right now, and it's actually very beautiful. My uncle, he is, I want to say in his mid-60s. And it was during COVID that him and I went to go get some tacos and beers. And I had, I was very like unsure where my uncle stood um, when it came to the elections and politics and what he felt about COVID. And we started to have this very powerful conversation. And I had no idea that he was on the borderline of the red pill and the blue pill. And he started to tell me how he felt like there was more to life. And he said that, you know, during COVID that he didn't have anything else to do, but to be on Twitter. And then he had nothing else to do, but to talk to his other friends that were retired. And they started sharing a bunch of articles and things on YouTube. And it was in that conversation where I think my uncle at 65 um, accepted the red pill, which was like awesome to witness. And he started to have the epiphany of like, 
oh my God, I can create my reality. He started to realize that my wife being angry at me has nothing to do with me. It has to do with her. And so it gave me hope that any person right now who is open to receive new information or, and have awareness um, that they are now going to be on the path of their journey as long as they keep choosing curiosity, as long as they keep choosing um, to let go of what they think they know and look at other aspects that might be new to them. And so I'm, I, I believe right now, going back to your original question, um, I think it's split. I think that there are people like my uncle at even 65 took the red pill. And then for me, my mom, who is also 65, she took the blue pill. And I have to accept that as her journey. And I'm not here to change that for her or force my way upon her. And I just believe that that's what they chose um, before they even came to this existence. And people has a choice, right? Um, we all have our own different journey. And, you know, my son calls that opening your third eye. Mm -hmm. He, yeah, he reminds me that all the time whenever he sees me, you know, when I'm working on any life coaching thing or just anything that is with, you know, life coach, he reminds me, you know, you've opened up your third eye. <laughs> and I said, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, once that third eye opens, you're going down the rabbit's hole. <laughs> <laughs> and, there, and there's going to be time where you're like, eject, eject, eject. And it's like, I'm sorry, buddy. Like, it's open. And it when your third eye opens, it can be scary. Mm -hmm. And because your whole paradigm is now shattered. And you've, you have this, like, warm, fuzzy, cozy little space in your life. And it's something that you can control and it's something you can manipulate. But the minute that third eye opens, it's like everything's going to come through. Um, and then you're going to question yourself. You're going to question reality. You're going to think you're crazy. You're going to think no one's going to understand you. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's a million light workers in the world to hold space for you. And, you know, and then in that space, you're like, change is coming. Because once your third eye is open, you can't be the victim anymore in your life. It is like, wow, I, I, there's cause and effect in life. And wow, I get to say no, and I get to choose me. And you start to open up to that space of like, I've been programmed and conditioned. Like my beliefs aren't even my beliefs. My values aren't even my values. They were just taught to me and I accepted them. But now when your third eye is open, it's like, you got your freedom to now start choosing for yourself. Mm hmm. When COVID hit, it, to me, it was a blessing. Mm -hmm. It was, it allowed me. So the first shadow I got is, I never forget after we did our first three-day seminar when we started life coaching school uh, over a year ago. And after that Sunday, when we all went back home, I was messed up. I didn't take a whole day off work. I, I just didn't know what the hell was going. What do I believe anymore? It, all these things were happening to me. I, I called him. I had a coach at the time too. I called him and said, dude, what the hell is going on? My mind's messed up. I can't focus. I felt low of energy. So that's when my eye opened up. But back to COVID is this gave me a time to realize I was on a treadmill. And treadmill was, you know, just as a trainer, you're working, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. You know, you're running your own business. You're trying to make money because you have to stand, sustain a certain amount of income in California. Mm. And when COVID hit and gyms got closed, I realized, wait a minute, I like waking up at, you know, it's five o'clock in the morning, reading my book. And I like taking my dogs and walk. And I don't want to go back to the gym, working on 60 plus hours a week. How, how was that serving me? How was that any value? What was I getting? Oh, I made a bunch of money to do what? Spend more money? I, I don't understand. Do I really need all that? Mm -hmm. And that's when it opened up. So that's when, um, you know, I left California. So I moved to Washington. I'm starting over again from scratch to a new business. Um, and to me, I didn't like the fact when this whole COVID happened, I was watching the news. I was one of those people watching the news just to get the up updates. Before I knew it, news was controlling me. I became one of those people that went to the grocery store, started loading up on canned goods, loading up on rice, loading up on noodles. And 24 hours later, I said, wait a minute, Ron, hold on a second here. You do not want nothing controlling you. So watching the news is controlling you. Do you want something controlling? I said, no, I don't. And for then on, I never, I never watched news again. I have not watched news since February. 
Now, if I want to check some facts, I go online and do my own research or I ask some questions. I, I refuse to watch the news because in my book, I am the problem and solution to myself. So if I want to solve a problem, I have to look internal to solve it versus external. So my problem to solve was, you know what, let me fact check things and let me not listen to things that are controlling me. Let me control myself. Mm -hmm. And that that's um, actually a lot of, you know, with a lot of people, I, I hate to say and judge like, you know, the mistakes that a lot of people make is that they let, let's say the news control them. They let what they hear from other people control them. But these are, again, people, a lot of people are out there that they don't have that type of self, that self-awareness. You know, um, I mean, we're, we're coaches. I coach, we coach ourselves. We have our own professional coaches, which is us. Um, they don't, they don't have that. And again, it's, it, this is what happens. And when COVID hit, that's exactly what had happened to so many people in the world is they had allowed those, the news, the people, what they hear, and others to control them. Yeah, definitely. I, I truly believe COVID has been a blessing if you see the blessing within the mass. And with COVID, and I know that many people are going to come in with different perspectives, and it's not about who's right or who's wrong, because at the end of the day, they're it's creating fear mm -hmm. if you don't have the awareness and it's creating separation. Mm -hmm. um, and those are like two of the lowest uh, frequency and vibrations um, that will keep us stuck. And so I, I question people. I'm like, what are you watching on the news that you're searching for that you can't find within yourself? And there was a point I did the same thing. I, I was addicted to Twitter and it would just bring more fear into me. And I was like, hold up. Like, why are you allowing this tool to take over you and, and start to set a boundary with myself and to have the awareness and be able to have a healthier relationship with it? Because at, at the end of the day, you have to take radical responsibility for yourself and mm -hmm. what is going to serve you so that you can continue to serve others. Right. And I had a, um, so I also coach volleyball and a former player of mine, um, that I've recently connected with um, a couple of days ago, we were talking about, I was having a conversation with her about this. And she told me this. She said, two things happened to people during COVID or during the pandemic or being quarantined. And I said, what is it? And she said, they either had a glow up or they had a glow down. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, okay, explain. So she had explained it. And I asked her, what was yours? She said, mine was a glow up. So during that time and being quarantined, she had more time and a lot of time to think for think for herself and think who she really is and who who is this, you know. So she pretty much grown from being somebody else that she wasn't because she was in her mind, you know, for her, she was being raised. She was being raised differently basically she th that's not what she wants mm -hmm. it, it's not her and now she said now I've you know she this this is coming for a 14 year old and she said now I've realized I'm in control of myself not my mom not my dad and not all these other people it's me I have my own fashion this is this is me this is my personality this is the kind of attitude I have and then for her to realize and understand that, I know, again, 14 years old, she's actually, you know, it did something good for her where she's realized she has a choice and she's in control of what she wants to happen for her and her emotions, everything that she thinks. Definitely an old, wise soul. And I mean, these young adults, I mean, these teenagers, they are light years ahead of us, like beyond like intellectually, because they, 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 they grew up in a different phase than we did. And so uh, I know like for me, I grew up with organ trail and I grew up mm -hmm. uh, with a typewriter and a fax <laughs> machine. Yes. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. Cassette tape. Me too. Even the cassette Walk tape, in. you know. <laughs> Library card. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> and it's so awesome to see what I call these old wise souls, these reincarnated souls come on and they are even beyond their parents. 
just their intellect and their way to reframing and not being the victim in their lives. And so, you know, I, I love that. And I love that we have a future leader uh, uh, or yeah. she's already a leader. I know. <laughs> And that, and that's so exciting to see that this is the future generations to follow behind us. Yeah, and I, I loved hearing that from from a teenager because it's it's something that you don't hear a lot from that age. You know, I mean, even us adults, we still go through that, and we still, you know, go through figuring out who we really are and what we really want in life. Mm-hmm. And um, speaking of, I have a, another question for you. So. You, um, I know in one of your profiles, I mentioned that uh, you had, I think I sort of identified yourself as a gypsy and I am curious um, where that came from. Yeah. So how you do anything is how you do everything. And <laughs> <laughs> so from a very, since birth, since birth, my mother had us moving every year. I don't think I have very memories of me being in the same house more than a year or two. And so that has stayed with me through the decades of life. And I identified that um, as I moved six times in the last year and a half. And I had to sit with myself and be like, what's going on? Like, I know change is great. And I know that traveling the world and having a different environment can set you up for success. But I also had to be real raw and truthful with myself. And I'm like, and I, and what came through for me was you're not grounded. And what also came through to me is you're not committed. And so, and this was just me being with my channels and being in my meditations and So my whole entire life, I have had this thing of not only do I move every year, but like I sell everything and I buy new stuff. I sell everything and I buy new stuff. And I'm like, oh my God, how much money have I spent That's a lot of work. (laughs) (laughs) And so I moved. uh, So I was in California in January and then COVID hit and I was in Chicago for a little bit. And then from Chicago, I went to Augusta, Georgia, and then I was in Augusta, Georgia for four months. And then I moved to Simpsonville, South Carolina. And, and this is all just this year. So four times oh in my a God. year. <laughs> <laughs> and I've had friends say like, oh, you're a gypsy, you're a gypsy. And I, I didn't really take it seriously until you move to a small town, Simpsonville, South Carolina, and you meet a native here. And one of my neighbors, he is a native. He's lived here for 47 years. He has never been on an airplane. He has not gone very far than one to two states. And he was like, you are a gypsy. He's like, you just roll up in your little wagon and Mm -hmm. you roll up the drapes and you're like, come drink the sugar water. And you just let everyone like, come. (laughs) And so my nickname is, it's also sugar water. He's like, oh, you want to go talk to that girl for the sugar water? Mm Because I'm the spiritual gypsy woo-woo one. And so that's kind of how people have identified me is nobody can keep up with me. They're like, you're either in another state another country, you're in a different apartment, you've moved here to there. And so I think people, they live vicariously through me, because Mm -hmm. I change so much. I am like a chameleon. I'm a shapeshifter. (laughs) And you're living your life. Living my life. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It sounds to me that um, at this point in your life, or, you know, for however many years you've been doing this, you're, you're pretty much living your life to the fullest. I I see it. mm -hmm. I definitely think that once I left corporate and I let go of the fear of a 401k and having bonuses and healthcare, I let that fear go is when I truly started to embody freedom. And, and I'm not talking about being able to work from home and work your own hours. Those are the benefits of freedom, but it was the internal freedom of knowing that I'm fully supported by God and that I'm fully supported by the universe and that I did not have to lean in um, on anyone anymore and that I just was going to have faith and know that. I'm living my purpose. And I truly believe when you're in your purpose, 
you will have the most abundance and prosperity in your life. Mm-hmm. And, and that to me was the freedom that I got within. Isn't it more of a very free, like that feeling of a freeing feeling? It, you just feel so, you feel light. Very, very light. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And I mean, not to make entrepreneurship look easy. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to paint that picture for anybody. (laughs) You know, becoming an entrepreneur, you wear multiple hats um, in entrepreneurship until you start to hire a team and you start to outsource things. Um, But the feeling of light when you are living your purpose and knowing that like what you're doing, and it doesn't matter if you're an entrepreneur or if you're a domestic engineer, or if you're a school teacher, or an art teacher, or a doctor, or a nurse, when you know that you're waking up every single morning, eating and breathing and doing what God brought you to do on this planet, like that lightness is just, it's just a space that you can't even put a price tag on it, you know? Yeah. And I'm saying that, that type of feeling, because I, I, I resonate with that a lot because, you know, with working corporate before and, and I was once an independent recruiter, it was so, you know, it was kind of nice to, to earn a certain amount, right? (laughs) Money was good, but you know that there's a piece of you that you're not as happy as you think you are because you're helping other people. But once you really find that, I mean, you know, just going through, I have, I have kids. So of course I had to think about not only myself and my kids, like, how am I going to feed them? How, I, but like you, once I got myself out of that situation or that fear of, well, I'm not going to have any money. This is not going to be enough for this or that. But once I started doing what I really wanted to do and, you know, where I felt that this was it more for me. And then if I take away the whole money situation and not think about that. It just, it was a different feeling. It, it was just a different, and then and knowing and telling yourself that you're going to be okay. Everything will be okay, but just do what you love to do. It, it was fine. And I'm just kind of like living the life and just being calm about it. And just, you know, like we said, just walking your purpose, just walking through it. You know, Ray, when I'm listening to you, I hear, I, I've said, I haven't said anything for a while because I, I, I'm absorbing all this stuff like a sponge. But what I, what I, you know, we all deal with this fear, right? It comes up, especially with the corporate background we all have had. What work have you done to eliminate that fear? Like fear of 401k, fear, I'm going to, because I remember I quit my full-time job. The first thing came out of my, my boss's mouth was, what about your benefits? What about your 401k plan? I'll figure it out. That's what I told him. I'll figure it out. I'll make it work. So my question for you is that how do you, You've done the work for yourself, but how do you help eliminate that or does it ever go away? I think fear is a blessing and it's, it's a part of the emotional scare, uh, emotional scale, anger, sadness, hurt, fear, guilt, and shame. And I believe when fear comes, it is an alert system and it's, it's letting you know that something might be effective or ineffective in your life, or maybe you're coming to a T in the road and it's time to make change. So I love fear. When fear comes in, I'm like, ooh, what's here for me? I'm very, very curious about it. And with fear, with anything, um, you have to break through or you're going to still be sitting in the same position from a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. And so in fear is beautiful because the job of the unconscious mind is to protect you. That's its whole job. And so you have to train the unconscious mind, like you're training a puppy, like it's okay. I know that you're trying to keep me protected. You don't want me to jump out of this airplane and go skydiving because your job is to keep me safe. And so we have to train it that going forward, I'm going to be okay. And that's, you can easily do that by finding the evidence. And so let's say we do take the example of jumping out of an airplane and I'm, I'm scared shitless of heights. And And so you have to prove to the unconscious mind will be safe. And so you do research, you go on YouTube and you look up all the people that have jumped out of a plane 
And now you've proven to your subconscious mind will be okay. You can take it a step further and you can go interview someone who has achieved your goal. And so then you're getting the good, the bad, the ugly. And again, you have someone physically, tangibly in front of you saying, you can do this. Anyone that has achieved your goal is automatic permission slip that you can do it too. And so it's one recognizing the fear is here and get excited about it. We've been trained that fear means scary. Fear means you're going to contract in. Fear means you have to be guarded. But can we have a new relationship with fear and make it our friend? And there was a great story about samurai fighters. And what they would do is they would premeditate before going into the fight, them losing. And they would premeditate watching it in their vision, in their mind, seeing themselves actually lose and feel that in their nervous system. Then they would premeditate the next round of them winning. And then they would anchor themselves in that feeling of winning the, the match. And so you have to put yourself in it. And the first step is probably visualization. And then what's the next baby step? Um, maybe before jumping out of an airplane, you know, what would be the step before that? And then you gradually have compound interest and you break through the fear. Mm -hmm. You know what? Um, that's so true about the samurai. And I, uh, I don't know if I've ever actually mentioned this in the podcast, but I used to do, um, I'm here. I think I think we have lost her. Oh, I'm here. Sorry. Sorry about that. Can you guys hear me? No, now, now we can hear you. Lost you for a second. <laughs> oh, you did? Okay. Sorry. Um, so yeah, I was what I was saying was about the samurai is that that's true how they meditate and before um they do competition. So I can't remember if you guys caught this one, but and I don't think I've ever mentioned this in any of the podcasts is that I used to take martial arts and I used to compete competitively and I used to travel for it. And just like the samurai, and this is what I teach my, uh, my students and my players is that you take those fear as a motivation, as a challenge to yourself. So before my fight or before I compete, um, before I'm up next and I could be sitting there waiting for my turn to be called facing my opponent or facing all these other people. I'm sitting there watching, but my mind is somewhere else. And where that is, is I'm premeditating um, with my eyes open and watching everybody else up. Premeditating is I do the same thing. I ha have that vision of losing, getting kicked in the head, getting kicked or punched somewhere where I'm hurt. But I start and I when I stepped in there in the front where I, it's my turn to compete, that's already been turned to a challenge. I've already challenged myself. I've already had that vision. So when I get there, I then I you know it's it's all positive for me. Like I you know I I kick me in the head or whatever, and I need to fight this way. And it, it does work. It really does. And so you. So I've had the discipline of facing my fears in that way. And I think in, in, in your way, um, Ray, is pretty much almost the same thing, but just all still kind of somewhat different. But it really does work. Yeah, Dr. Joe Dispenzia, he is like the master at this when that we can actually create new neural pathways in our brain, in our mind by visualization all by itself. And they did a study where they had people come in and they physically played the piano every day for eight hours for a week. And then they allowed them to go home. And then a week later, they brought them back and they did not put a piano in front of them. They hooked them up to a bunch of little brain scan, little monitors to their head. And they said, play the piano. And even though the piano wasn't in front of them, they were playing it in memory. And what they did is it was through that practice that they created the new neural pathways, which now gave them the confidence and the insurance that they knew that they would uh, succeed. And so that's what we have to do with our minds is train it 
to be able to see over and over and over you completing um, what you want to complete. Uh, who was it? It's Tony Robbins. He was working with Sierra Williams and there was a time in her career where her game was just not on par. I'm sorry, that's more of a golf term, but her game. <laughs> <tennis game. laughs> <That's okay. laughs> her tennis game was tennis. You know, tennis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <a little> shitty. <laughs> and and it was through it was through first realizing, okay, what's happening in your personal life? Because whatever happens in your personal life, you take it to work. And so first they had to work on the subconscious blocks and get to the root of things. And then once they cleaned that up, then they were able to go into the visualization um, and seeing herself play over and over and over and executing her hits. Um, and that's how she ended up, I think, one year winning Wimbledon was because of working with uh, Tony Robbins. Yeah, she was winning back to back. And I think sometimes also you it's almost like you have to think of the worst sometimes. I mean, oh, worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that's how, for me, that's how it works. Sometimes I have to think of the worst and then it, before competing. And so when I step there and I get there in front of everybody or the whole world, it's actually total opposite, you know. And again, it's uh -huh. a challenge. Yeah. One of the things I do is I certify uh, new life coaches. And when we're training them, when we're taking them through the three days of training, uh, we help them to set up SMART goals for their clients. And one of the questions is, a powerful question is, what is the worst case scenario if this doesn't happen, if your goal doesn't come to flourishing? And it's like, we have to shine light on the worst case scenario. Like, just be real, raw, it's here, but this is the worst case scenario. And so, you know, like, you could do all these other things and never even see the worst case scenario. Um, but we got to shine light on it and, and be able to accept it, right? Because mm -hmm. if you don't accept it, then you're just ignoring it. And then you're being pushed by probably some other pain in your life. So I right. love that. Right. That's amazing right there. I thought about that myself. So I don't know if I train myself or think about it, but I don't focus on worst case scenario because I always say to myself, regardless of what happens, I'll figure out a way. Mm -hmm. So how most people say, well, if plan B doesn't work, if plan A doesn't work, I get plan B, then so forth and so on. Me, I say, well, I may not, plan A may not work out, but it may give a new trajectory to something else. Because for me, my whole life is, is really, I believe life is transitory. So nothing is infinitely determined. And just because something didn't work out does not mean at the same time I've been sent another way which is more beneficial for me what i really want so i really work on my work on my spirituality you know all of us want to pray for a better health for ourselves for our loved ones family members and so forth i realize over the months now i'm starting to pray for more wisdom and perseverance and at the same time praying for my loved ones for good health and all that stuff but i want that wisdom because when that plan a may not work out you want wisdom and fortitude to at least figure it out, right? Or, or something to come to light you didn't see the first time. Uh, so I, I guess, I don't know, if, if, if being the fact you train life coach yourself, do you think that's a right path to just only focusing on whatever outcome or should I always plan for a worst case scenario? Yeah. So we should, what I teach my students and what I teach my clients is do not get attached to the goal. You're going to set the goal. You're going to put it out there to the universe. And then you're going to not be fixated on it because if you're fixated on it, then you're trying to control it. And then when you control it, you put yourself in a box and you might miss the magic around you. And so being able to say, this is my goal. This is what I'm looking for. But really it's how you're, what's really at the root of it is how do you feel when you reach that goal? Because a lot of times, your goals have been in front of you and you didn't recognize it because you wanted it to look a certain way. You thought it should look like X, Y, Z, but the goal comes in looking differently, but because you didn't have an attachment to the feeling sensation, you missed it. And so what's most important is one, the manifestation, I would say first the awareness. And then the second is I'm putting it out to the universe. This is what I'm calling in for myself. And then let it go. Don't get attached. 
And then the next one is, how will I feel when it's there? Because if I feel it, then I might be at my goal already. And then the next thing is um, being open. It might come in a different way and be open that you chose the right path. And in that path, it might send you down a different tra- trajectory, you know, but it was the first step, but God always has more for you. So basically the, the idea is to be open to all possibilities, but not fixated on one specific thing. Yeah. So if you are also, when it comes to goal setting, uh, yes, manifestation is powerful, right? But you also have to be an action. Mm -hmm. And so when you're taking what I say aligned action, then you are working towards the goal, but it's through the steps of aligned action that you might actually discover something different and discover something that you never even expected. So it goes back to what I learned in school too: trust the process. Mm, Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trust Mm -hmm. the process. Cause you know, we all, (laughs) it always goes back to the one I read in a book, um, I think it was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. He says, we always pray for something and we think God is supposed to give us, us this, this special, amazing gift wrap present. And that's what we prayed for. No, it never shows up that way. It shows up, but we just missed the prayer or we missed the, the universe. We missed something because we expect it to look a certain way. We expect that present to look very refined, especially wrapped, but we missed the whole process and what it was happening. Mm-hmm. So, and that's what I tell my clients too, is it's very important in life. You know, you are where you should be at the right time. You really got this trust the process. You will get what you want, but you in the process, it's a lot of meat and in the process, a lot of things that can be abundance. And if you miss that, then you, you're so fixated on, okay, I got to quit this job because I got to make more money. Okay, then what? What's next? And that's why I tell them, trust the process. You where you should be at the right time. And I say that because I'm 30, I turned 37 90 days ago. And 10 years ago, if someone had told me this, I think they got to go to see a psychiatrist or a witch doctor or something like that. Something's wrong with their mind. And it's really because I wasn't ready to accept something different. But mm-hmm. two or three years ago, when I actually started doing the work, I was willing to accept there are vibrations, there's a universe. What was a shocker for me almost six months ago was I was reading a book called Letting Go by David R. Hawkins, another one that does conscious and uh, therapy work. I didn't know from a kid, I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness, that there's a difference between spirituality and religion. Yeah. When I read that six months ago, it's like, really? Are you trying to tell me the whole time I'm thinking the right religion and religion and spirituality are completely opposites? And then I was like, wait, wait a minute here. So then I realized I did more research. And obviously being that Jesus Christ, you know, that's what our parents believed in. It, we're missing a lot of different things there. Like we're missing the fact that Buddha was born before Jesus Christ. We're missing the fact that this happened for that. And it's, it's like, man, we got to focus on spirituality and the universe versus a specific religion. Because another thing, the Testament we were reading in the Bible had revelations, which is when God ends the world and new new world starts and all this stuff. That's in the New Testament. We never, as a kid, ever read the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. So I was like, wow. So it's just, it's amazing all this work out there. And the process, again, is I'm just trusting the process on where I should be at the right time. And all these things we're doing with the podcast and, and stuff is just really, really good work. Yeah, when you say trust the process, it that's the space of growth. And I always say like our life is 80% of the work. And I always give this analogy. And what it is is that you're sitting on the sofa and then on the other side is a castle. And in between is a forest. And your job every day is to get off of the sofa by choosing you and then go into the forest. And it's in the forest that you might get hit with an arrow. You might get hit with a fireball coming through. You might encounter a dragon. You might encounter, you know, a a fighting force. And then that right there, what you go through in that moment in the forest 
is a part of the process. It's the growth. And so, yes, we're working towards the castle, but the great thing about what we do with coaching, coaching is really about your client being in the forest. Mm-hmm. And it's about getting them back off of the sofa, get back into the court, uh, back into the forest, because it's through that that we grow. It's through that that we expand and we start to realize, oh, wait a minute, I don't have to go this way. I can go that way. And I don't have to say yes, I can say no. So I, I love that. You know what the hardest thing after the forest analogy? It's the first time I ever heard that one. That's amazing. And it, the, what hit me right on the head right now with the hammer was, you know, you be in a relationship with somebody and you see all the possibilities, you see infinite things happening, but they don't see it. Mm. They, they see, well, think she's going to be this way. Mm-hmm. You know, and no, it could be any way. There's no right or wrong. No, this is right and this is wrong. I said, there is no right or wrong. Right or wrong is only based upon your journey perception. So I'm trying, and I tried to to talk to her about it and just, I just leave it alone. Like, you know, hey, when you're ready, you will talk, but I just leave it like it is because she doesn't really understand the work I've done and how much this work, even right now, Ray, talking to, talking to you in this podcast, you're basically adding to my journey. See, we're a teacher and a student at the same time. Mm-hmm. You don't realize what you're saying is giving me power. And what I mean by that is, even though we never met in person, it's the first time we ever talked, but the vibrational is so high, we're meeting each other in the middle. So when you said the T earlier, and what I mean by T was, I'm at a crossroad right now, where is, should I continue with training because that platform exists and I know that one, or should I turn to the left, which is what I really want and what I'm passionate about? See, the fear that comes up is, well, you don't know if you can make money, right? Because that's my belief system. My belief system is lack, lack of not having enough money because I've been there, but it's constant work with me. So, or should I turn to the right and do what I already know? And I ask my, I check in with myself, which is, Ron, what is your purpose? What do you really want? And I, when I check in myself, my head turns to the left and says, you want to help people. You want to become that speaker. You want to do all these things because I realized driving from California to Washington on a 14 half hour drive that my goal was at 46 um, to be a multimillionaire, okay? Because the idea is the more money you have, the better off. I have to listen to this audible by Napoleon Hill called How to Own Your Own Mind. I realized I will be rich. I'll be rich by helping out a million people. Because mm-hmm. entirely, do I really need to be a multimillionaire to, to live life, to travel, to have nice clothes, to live somewhere? No, I know a lot of people that live on less, way less. So if I help out a million people, that means... I energetically go with them for the rest of their life. So I'm fulfilling my purpose in this universe. So that's what I mean by you're going to go with me and throughout the rest of my life, because what you're saying here resonates so high vibrational that I can't help but proceed forward. And it gives me more, um, I guess I'd be, I'd be the guy that's a parachute going on internet researching, but it gives me more uh, energy the fact I'm on the right path my purpose. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing, Ray, I, I want to say this. I, I know it's been over an hour, but this is so amazing. I, I just can't stop. I'm eating up like a fat kid loves cake. Okay. I just can't keep, keep eating it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> so, it's virtual. It's virtual. Hey. Chocolate cake. <laughs> yes. I love cake. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm eating it up. Like, I mean, today's oh. Halloween, right? So I'm eating up like cake. Oh. Oh. As oh we proceed God. forward in this podcast and we go our separate ways after the podcast, what is one thing vibrational, right? You want to say to the rest of the universe right now? Say your question one more time. So what is one thing vibrational means higher level. You would mm-hmm. like to say to our listeners and to the rest of the universe right now to empower those people. Mm, I love it. There's so much I can say, but I will tell you, (laughs) uh, live your life in gratitude and you will see your world shift. Mm -hmm. I love it. I will live my life in gratitude forever now. Yeah, that's a good one. It's like saying gratitude is the right attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Yes, it is. And and also um, to add to that, Ray, if you can also... um, share to our listeners where they can find you or how, you know, if they want, if 
they want to take your classes and yeah. Yeah. So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. The name is Ray Carmen. So it's R-A-E-C-A-R-M-E-N for those two social media platforms. On LinkedIn, it would be uh, Desiree Slesher. And then on my website, you can go to templeofbreath.com and you can see all of my weekly classes that I offer where I understand that people are busy in this world, but I'm also a big believer in you are worthy of 30 minutes to give yourself an opportunity to drop into self and do a 30 minute class that will vibrationally and energetically uh, be able to support you to keep being the badass that you are. And so I hold weekly, cl- weekly classes that people can take. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and actually that's Desiree with a Z. Yes. Not mm-hmm. an S, yeah. Correct. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I, I, I think I might join uh, one of your breath works. I'll, I'm, I'm curious about it. And do you hold it just for my my purposes? Do you hold it every day, once a week? When when, when do you class? Or should I look online the calendar? Yes. Yeah, so I am going to be holding a weekly class for thirty minutes. And please, I would love for any of the listeners that get this on the replay, if you send in a message, actually, we'll do a coupon code um, for you guys. So uh, let's uh, what should we call it? Um, what's the name of your guys' podcast? Life's a shuffle. Life's a shuffle. I'm so sorry. Um, So if you put in uh, life shuffle as a coupon, um, all of your listeners will be able to get a uh, free class with me. And so 30 minutes breath work. It might be somatic dance. It might be sound bowls. You just never know with me because I'm a shapeshifter, but it will definitely (laughs) be the space for you to actually receive. You don't have to do anything except for show up for yourself and be in a space of receiving and just allow the body to speak to you. Awesome. Okay. I'll be joining one of your classes. I wrote down a promo code. I put it on our podcast and I replay it on YouTube and also Apple podcast and everything else out there. Um, But Ray, thank you. It was a pleasure. I appreciate it. And as always, our listeners, this is Ron Johnson, your life coach, motivation speaker and health coach. And if you're in a place that you you need help, myself, Gloria and Ray are here to help you. But there's always help out there and you can always live the best life that you want to have with with the opportunity of knowing you have a choice. Yes. And again, thank you for um, joining us today, Ray, and um, for sharing your journey, your story, and and what you do. Um, again, this is Gloria, your life coach, and thank you for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle.